Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. Another off-the-cuff video for you today. I want to talk about the dystopian future that awaits us as a result of the increased automation and the erosion of our civil liberties, rights and freedoms ever so incrementally with the advancement of technology. One of the simplest ways to project what the future is going to look like is by taking a reversal of the past. So what do I mean by that? Look at mankind at its most primitive. And when I say most primitive, synonymous with that is most self-reliant because the most primitive of societies are truly self-reliant. I'm not talking about self-reliant as in I'm going to go buy a bunch of tools from the hardware store then move off grid and periodically come to town for flour, gasoline and all the rest of the staple bare necessities that I need. I'm talking true living off the land, primitive self-reliance. You take the complete opposite of that and that's what the future is going to be. It's going to be complete technological dependence through and through in every possible way you can imagine. That's why there's this final push of this off-grid movement. And I made a video called The Off-Grid Outsider. Go check out that video here. Now within that video, I talked about the domestication of modern man and how as we evolve, we're becoming more inside creatures. We shed the fur we once had. You know, we no longer need any of the natural protective, organic, biological mechanisms that animals have to shelter themselves from nature because we basically live inside 24 hours a day. This is evidenced in the fact that most new housing developments have yards that are five foot by five foot and these giant houses. Everything is inside nowadays. Perhaps there's an agenda that you don't want people outside too much or else maybe they might organize and unite and actually communicate like human beings used to communicate and therefore there wouldn't be as much control in the hands of the state, the technocracy. This is the reason why a lot of legislation is trying to push people off the land uh, with the increasing corporatization of agriculture. There's no more small scale farming operations. It's become increasingly hard to live off the land because you have all these permits and taxes and regulations that you have to abide by. So essentially you become an off-grid outsider and that's why there's this drive towards tiny homes, self-reliance, preparedness, survival. It's a final yearning for the individuality and the independence that comes with living more simply as we move full steam ahead into the hyper-dependent technocracy that awaits us. So in this edition of my predictions of the dystopian future, I want to talk about automotives and where that's going because it would seem as though we're incrementally moving towards automated self-driving cars. But the question is, what are they going to use to sell that? Well, I think it's pretty clear that in light of all of these sadistic deplorable attacks where people are driving their cars into crowds of people anyways what they're incrementally going to do is take the driver out of the equation and as with most advancements in technology this is going to be so gradual and people are going to become so incrementally adapted to it and thus dependent on it that nobody's going to really put up a fuss until they realize that at any time the powers that be could push a kill switch on your vehicle and basically you're not going to be able to drive that vehicle unless somebody else says so. Now you have a, a combining of different technologies which are going to go into this. You have your biometrics so at some point in order to drive your vehicle they're going to offer you biometrics so you're no longer going to need a key already we're in push button the push button era with vehicles you can start your car with your smartphone for some vehicles and you can basically start your car by pushing a button the key is going to be ancient technology pretty soon so there they're going to get your fingerprint they're going to get your iris scan they're going to get your facial 
recognition, voice recognition. They're going to use all of those things to make sure that it's you who is driving your vehicle. Next, they're going to find a way to put a camera in the car. Maybe they're going to market it as a phone feature or something like that. I mean, there's cameras are already ubiquitous. There are security systems. There's one on your Xbox. There's one in your laptop, one in your phone, everywhere you go. But the final place to put a camera, and I'm not talking pointing out of the vehicle like a dash cam, which most cars have those on them now too. I'm talking about pointing inside the vehicle. I seen a commercial for a vehicle the other day that now has this technology where the car will automatically stop if it senses an obstacle in front of it. Now, this would be a good thing, of course, when it comes to stopping from committing those very heinous crimes. But of course, it comes at the cost of our own freedoms. Thus, we move towards more dependence and further from independence. Eventually, Google is going to start selling their self-driving technology to automobile manufacturers. And that's going to be combined with Google Maps. So you have GPS, Google navigation, you have all the biometrics, you have all the sensors on the vehicle itself. You have the in-car, the out-of-car surveillance. You now have cars that on the dash you can see a 360 image of what's around your car at all times. So we're really on the brink of self-driving cars. And all of these technologies are going to combine into giving us just that. And on the one hand, this could be very efficient. I've often thought, maybe you've thought of this too, that say you're at a red light and you're in a lineup of 10 cars. So here's you, here's 10 more cars. Now the first car, when it starts driving, the car behind it waits a little bit and as it sees that that person is pulling ahead, it starts turning its wheels, it starts moving, it presses on the gas, it starts moving, the car behind it then starts moving ahead, the car behind that notices that. So it's more sequential. It's not simultaneous. It's not everybody starting to turn their wheels at the same time and moving right away. If it was that, you'd probably cut traffic jams by at least 50%. So there's a lot of benefits to having cars communicate with each other. And that's another thing. They're going to have cars communicating with each other, cars communicating with the traffic lights. Basically, it amalgamates to the smart grid. And if you don't know what the smart grid is, it just means that everything out there has a sensor in it and interacts with each other uh, via these various frequencies, Wi-Fi, near field communication, uh, broadband. So there definitely is a benefit to this in terms of improving safety, improving the efficiency. But of course, it comes at a cost because then what you're going to have is you may potentially have a system by which you are limited to the amount you can drive. Once you've reached your quota for the amount of mileage you've put on, say, in a given week, your car just won't work. Uh, perhaps you won't be able to exceed the speed limit to a certain extent. I'm sure they'll give you 10 or 20 kilometers or miles an hour grace, but beyond that, maybe cars in the future won't be able to drive that fast or they'll be basically tailored to the laws of the place with which you live in, the country with which you live in. So what does this really have to do with preparedness and survival? When I'm talking about a futuristic, what some people might call a dystopia, others might call it utopia. But I think utopia and dystopia, at a certain point, you can use those terms interchangeably. Philosophically speaking, you could say that there is no dystopia that isn't perceived as a utopia first, and there's no utopia that doesn't eventually become a dystopia. And all of this is going to be put in the hands of a learning artificial intelligence. The smart grid and self-driving cars, just kind of like Google is right now, it's going to be a self learning system. It's going to be constantly getting better and better at what it does as the computing power improves in order to coordinate the flow of all this 
information. And so while the grid is going to get more and more smart, human beings are going to become incredibly dependent on that grid for survival. And of course, in all the areas that technology gets smarter in, we necessarily become kind of dumber in, simply because we no longer have to focus on that. I no longer have to remember directions to a place because I can just pull it up on GPS. It frees up my mind to think about other things, which probably are not as close to those primitive activities as they once were, as the act of remembering phone numbers and addresses and directions, things like that, spatial relations. So this becomes problematic for preparedness because the more domesticated and technologically advanced become, the greater the catastrophe were the grid to ever come down because every day that goes by, we are more and more wired in to the system. And some people are trying to counteract that by taking a couple steps backward, doing the off-grid thing, going camping, getting involved in preparedness and survival. But the natural flow is in that direction. I mean, we can't stop where it's going. I mean, you have people on YouTube who are trying to build these YouTube lifestyles, but they're broadcasting it on the internet. So obviously, there's a big foot in the door of the grid. So even though they're moving off grid, especially if you're an avid YouTuber, I mean, you're destined to be a part of the grid. You know, you, you can't uh, be a off-grid YouTuber. It's just an oxymoron. It's a contradiction of terms. Now, you can live a simple minimalist life where you're doing homesteading in every area but internet access. But by and large, nobody, and not even in the 1800s was anybody self-reliant. I mean, in the 1800s, when they were charting a course across America, there were wagons full of stuff which was manufactured in factories you know they weren't just uh collecting this stuff from the land and living like the aboriginal people of north america were where they basically got everything they needed from the land now i don't think maybe one percent of the stuff in your house is probably locally sourced so something to consider anyways i'm going to keep doing this dystopian series as I get the ideas for it. This one was about automotive stuff. If you'd like me to share my thoughts on the dystopian future in other aspects, maybe it's psychopharmaceuticals, maybe it's agriculture, media, um, wearable technology, things like that, let me know in the comments. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Show your support to the channel by picking up a bug out roll. I have some new colors, well one new color coming before Christmas for sure, and that is going to be the desert khaki kind of beige color that a lot of people have been asking for, so stick around for that. And of course there's the Amazon links in the description, there's Patreon, etc, etc. Now as per usual I got a handful of gear reviews, I got a lot of ongoing series, I've got some how-to stuff, some survival skills stuff, some hunting stuff. Uh, what else do we got? Fitness stuff, after the collapse stuff, everything is coming on this channel this winter. We are going full steam ahead. If you haven't noticed, I've been putting out a video almost every single day. I'm hitting it hard, trying to break through the barrier that's been put up here by YouTube. We're gonna break through it. You know, my philosophy of YouTube is very akin to my philosophy of survival. And it's that if I were to give up now, when it's at its hardest, when my numbers are at their lowest, believe it or not, across all the analytics. If I was to give up now after putting so much work into this channel, it's basically akin to me saying, well, I don't want to survive. Or it's basically like me giving up in a survival situation. So if I can't push through this bit of depression that we're in here with respect to YouTube, then like hell I'm gonna push through a survival situation. So if you have a YouTube channel and you are struggling right now and uh, you're wanting to give up, all I can say is just remember that this experience on YouTube is a reflection of what you do when times get hard. 
And I know you got to know when to fold them and you got to know when to walk away. But if you feel deep down that you have a unique perspective to communicate with the world via this social medium right here, then I would encourage you to stay the course, stay strong, stay focused. Thanks for watching. Canadian Prepper out.